Hello, everyone. Um, actually, this is a new format. I'm first time doing it. I'm not exactly sure what I sh should be doing, but part of my slides is there. So uh, we have three faculty members here from the Department of Statistics. So uh, actually, uh, there's one more. Maybe he will come a little bit. But uh, um, so we first will introduce ourselves a little bit um, and then uh, save some time for you in case you've got any, any questions. So my name is Hui Zhang. I'm a professor of statistics. I joined the department in 2011, so quite a while. Um, before that, I did my uh, undergrad and uh, master pro, uh, degree in computer science and then a PhD in computational statistics, uh, computational mathematics, and then I came here. Uh, my research is mostly in computational statistics, uh, geno uh, statistical genomics, bioinformatics, uh, with application in a variety of diseases but focus on uh, cancer biomarkers. And uh, these are some of the recent and ongoing projects I've been working on, like integrating different kinds of cancer types, trying to find uh, useful biomarkers. And uh, on the computational side, I, I do some computational uh, methods, algorithms to uh, accelerate resounding based upon testing, and also uh, develop optimization algorithm to, uh, for variable selection uh, in penalized modeling. And I'm handing over to my colleague here. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I'm not going to prepare that well. Um, I've, I've taught quite a few uh, courses uh, for the past decade, but currently I'm teaching three courses per se. Right now I'm teaching Biostat 600. It's an introduction to biostatistics uh, tool credit uh, uh, you know, uh, course, which is a, a math or stat and probability review course for students who are not math or stat major, like biology or engineering major. So uh, this is a crash course to review all the math components to prepare you for other downstream Biostat courses. Also right now I'm teaching Biostat 625 Computing with Big Data is a sort of intermediate to advanced uh, R and uh, programming course and computing course, which is uh, required um, if you're interested uh, you know, going into the Master in Health Data Science program, but they lack it if you're going to other Biostat uh, Master PhD program, and that's a free credit course. In the winter, I'm going to teach this one credit uh, sequential course of Biostat 612, right now 611, but there are two courses in, in SQL. It's basically graduate school and professional success skills, essentially develop all the out of class you know, skills like interview or networking or resume, all the stuff you know, which you don't typically learn from a, a formal course. And uh, besides teaching, you know, I, uh, all of us actually involved in uh, sort of a mentoring students uh, through different mechanisms. For example, each one of you will have an academic advisor. You can go talk to your advisor for any course or other things, you know, if you never have any question. And if you're doing research, you're gonna have a research advisor. Uh, apparently, if you do PhD, you have a PhD advisor, so all of them are gonna uh, guide you through for your research projects. And then on top of that, I'm uh, sort, sort of, uh, you know, uh, leading the, uh, you know, monitoring the uh, health data science master program, which was a new program. Started last year, now it's the second cohort, the coming one is the third cohort. You know, we have seen a uh, decent, you know, uh, uh, development of that program. So if you're interested in that, apparently, you know, feel free to talk to me, ask any question now, or talk to me during the lunch time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin P. I'm an associate professor in the department. I joined the department in 2006, but I started as a master student, two-year master, four-year PhD, and two-year postdoc, then I became a faculty member. So before that, um, in fact, my first undergraduate degree was in clinical medicine. I got that from China, and my hometown is in northeast of China. Then after that, uh, before I came here, I spent four years in Canada. I obtained my first uh, master degree in epidemiology over there. And then I obtained my second, second undergraduate degree uh, in mathematics from Canada. Then, uh, you know, uh, I know some of you may worry about the weather out here, you know, the, the winter of our, my colleague may disagree with me, but you know, my hometown is northeast of China, the winter much colder than here. And you know, uh, the winter of Canada, I really serve snow. So uh, I told the story before. Ava, you know, is the warmest place I have ever lived in. The winter I here, you know, it's cool, it's not cold. And the, my research, uh, I mainly work with survival analysis, healthcare provider profiling. Both Nika and I work for a center we call CAG. It's one of the largest center in SPH. You know, it's a kidney epidemiology and cost center. We evaluate healthcare providers, for example, transplant center facilities. Just like the five stars for the hotel, we evaluate their performance. Penalize those centers can be even closed based on our evaluation. 
Then I also, uh, I also work with risk prediction, and integration, machine learning, statistical optimization with application in organ transplantation, uh, kidney dialysis, psoriasis, cancer, and especially recently several years we uh, work with parallel documentation with large scale biomedical data set. Uh, this semester, I'm teaching one of the core course, uh, Biostatistics 53, that's for longitudinal analysis. And the next semester, I will teach 651, you know, the generalized linear models. I co taught this course several years ago with we were together. And the students student supporting, uh, we are advising 3DB students, and also we support the graduate student research assistant, we call GSRA. Yeah, that's all about me. Welcome to our group. Hey, hi everyone, uh, welcome. Um, so I'm Nick Hartman, I'm a research assistant professor. Um, I joined recently as a faculty member, but before that, um, I did my graduate training here within the department, so I'm pretty familiar with um, the programs here. Um, and then before that, I was studying um, biostats at Cornell. Um, I have some overlapping research interests with Kevin, uh, like survival analysis and evaluating the quality of healthcare. Um, I also work quite a bit on developing risk scores and also evaluating whether these risk scores are good enough to actually be used for clinical decision making. I um, also work quite a bit with epidemiologists and policymakers. So, uh, some of my research is focused on evaluating policies and whether they're actually doing what they're intended um, to do. Um, so, um, I work a lot in the um, kidney disease space and um, I focus on organ failure and transplantation as my main um, application areas of focus. Um, right now, I'm teaching this course, uh, Biostat 523, Statistical Methods in Epidemiology, which is pretty closely related to my research, and this is mostly intended for um, students within the epi department to uh, give them some advanced training in biostats, um, so that's something I definitely enjoy. Um, and then I work with students a lot uh, through, um, uh, as Kevin mentioned, this Kinney Epidemiology and Cost Center. Um, we have some uh, graduate student research assistants who work within there, and uh, we help mentor them. Um, so they get some real-world experience during their training. It's a really great experience for them. Um, and I also serve on the Student Recruitment Committee, so I'm very happy to see um, all of you here today. Um, I think that's all I have. We can open up for questions, maybe. Yeah, hello. Uh, so what would you say is the most like fulfilling part of the statistics for each of you guys? Yeah, I can try first and then <laughs> mess it up. Um, I think for me, it's like really seeing, um, you know, the impact um, in, in clinical settings and um, just like the broader health community. Like, a lot of my work is directly motivated by um, developing national healthcare policies. So, even like the most theoretical work that I do, eventually the goal is for it to be implemented and actually impact policy development and, and impact the, the healthcare that patients ultimately receive. So. I think that's the most re rewarding part for me, even though it's very quantitative and mathematical, is actually seeing the methods that we develop uh, being used in practice and, and impacting patients. Yeah, that's a very good cool question, and I totally agree with you. You know, for me, I you know I share my experience. I have a two undergraduate degree, two master degree. You can see I change the field very often. You know, it's like, but I really like biostat. Uh, just as Nick mentioned, we have our work make a big influence on the patient. Our work affect the millions of patients, the several thousand of facilities, and the hundreds of transplant centers. Because the patient compete with the donor. Because for those patients who need the organ donor, you know, not too many of them can really get the donor. The patient compete with that. On average, 13 patients die each year for, uh, on the kidney waiting list. And at the same time, each year, 20% of the donors are discarded. Just because the patient, they have a dilemma, whether they should wait for the good donor, everyone can pick for the good donor. The patient may die before they get the good donor, and whether they should accept the, the low-quality donor, even though in general, low-quality donor has still needed to better survival benefit compared with other treatment options, but the patient may die even quickly after they get the, the low-quality donor. That's the dilemma of the patient. They need our help. Like we hope we can provide a better prediction so that we really have you know, those patients. 
Yeah, I totally agree that the uh, application you know, side of clinical application is one of the very, you know, the, 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 the factor that motivates us working. For example, I'm actually uh, right now working with a couple of groups uh, dealing with cancer lung markers in various kinds of cancer, like breast cancer or other kinds of cancer. And you, you sit down with those uh, clinicians, oncologists, right? And then start talking about the product, you know, trying to see what you can help with the, with their data analysis. You actually find some, you know, targets which may actually uh, develop drugs. You know, it's a long way, but you contribute some part of it. And if you especially think about those uh, those uh, all of those conditions you sit down with, if you were trying to get an appointment from them, it might take you a month. But now they try to get an appointment with you to sit down with them and help with the research. So really, you're really helping them. You know, their time is valuable, your time is valuable. But you know, when you sit together, something new come out of it. That kind of feeling, I think, is very important. Yes, please. Um, what makes you decide to go into like faculty and research rather than kind of the biostats industry? Okay, I guess we. I'll start first. <laughs> <that, right? laughs> I, I think this is, uh, you know, probably uh, very much case by case. For me, you know, I, I sort of uh, uh, as always have this option for uh, you know in my in my radar because my, my father was a professor, so I grew up in a college campus. So that's kind of feeling you know, research and you know this kind of stuff is not uh, foreign to me ever since I was a kid. So being a scientist, researcher has always been one of the options for me. I also, you know, honestly I, I applied to the industry jobs as well, you know, interview that offer. I, I see how I intern as well. Just compare the two lifestyle. I just feel like you know being a being a uh, researcher is more based my personality, but you know I have nothing against going to the industry. My 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 spouse work in the industry. I have so many friends work in the industry. I think it's just different lifestyle. Yeah, that's also a very good question. I agree with the comment from Louis. It's personal choice, case by case. For example, seem to me people um, like what they have to do. I like to do research. I really enjoy doing research. That may be the main reason I. Hope I can stay as a faculty. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I also just really like the creative aspect of research. You get to come up with ideas that you think are important, and then just go pursue them. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, uh, share your research with others. It's just a not to say you can't do that in, in industry, but it's just a really nice part of being a faculty member is you have that ability to just explore your ideas um, and develop expertise in all these different areas. So with that, do you guys see a lot of freedom in the areas that you're able to explore? Like it's it's very open to what you're interested in, and you can kind of pick and choose. Really, is that what you would say? Or, or deciding on this? Yeah, I, I would say yes to that. Um, I'm constantly exploring new research directions, even though you know over time. I develop, you know, a lot of expertise in a very specific area, but then maybe you work with a collaborator and they need a specific type of uh, analytical support, and that leads to a lot of new questions and you start to get more and more familiar. So that's a really nice part of the job. And as a student, you'll also have that experience. There's so much uh, a variety in, in the faculty expertise here. Uh, people are working on such different areas that there's, there's so much opportunity to, to um, gain experience in these different topics. Right, it's a two-way street. On one hand, you know, we have the freedom to do what I, uh, we like to do. Like when I was a junior faculty, I like to work on more theoretical part. That may be the main reason I change from a clinical, uh, uh, change from a clinician to a uh, specific teacher. I like the theoretical part when I was a junior. But the more I work with my collaborator, the more I work in the real world, the more I appreciate the collaboration. The application really is, you know, I think to me that's the major reason now, you know, mo mo motivated my research ideas. But uh, um, at the same time, I still have the freedom to, to choose what I would like to work with. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. If you always have your uh, freedom to choose, right? You can read some papers, go to some conferences, listen to some talks, and you know, come up with some new idea, go ahead and try. No one stop you from doing that. At all, it's, it's just you have to work out the time to do that on top of your existing work. So, in the end, I would say I don't know about everything else, but I think my colleagues work very hard because they really like what they're doing. This morning, I just drove by trying to find a parking, uh, parking in the parking lot out there. It's full. 
this is Saturday. That's, that's kind of crazy, but that also tells us how many people actually come to work on Saturday. That, that, may, that, that cannot happen unless they're doing something they really like to do. Um, how have you guys seen the field change from the past, you know? Decade or two, you know, especially with a lot of emerging technologies. Yeah, I think that depends. Um, but definitely things are everything is changing so fast. And you know, do I work on I mostly deal with like large throughput, you know, uh, genomic data, which really uh, you know took off uh, about ten years ago, fifteen years ago when I was in uh, graduate school. That's when the technology and all the sequencing machine got developed. And nowadays, you know, they just routinely being used. That's also what makes, you know, my uh, sort of uh, expertise come into play because I got trained in the science and the digital math. Now all the clinicians, they're generating large scale data where they're not trained how to analyze them. Right, so that's, you know, that's the underlying driving reason why we formulate a team by trying to start, you know, analyze it. Because they, they, they got patient sample, they, they, they prepare a the sample, they sequence them, and then send the data to us and analyze them. Find them stick together, you know, discuss what how to move next. So the technology is definitely driving many things out of this, but that's just in my field. In other fields, you know, I, I assume something similar is happening. Yeah, right. I remember when I was a student, you know, the software we use, we call it SARS. At that time, we have ice plus. You may know that, you know, ice plus. Like, right now, no one uses ice plus anymore. And then for the last 20 years, you know, I think the photos, when we work with SARS, it's still the base. Especially when we work with pharmaceutical company, when we work with the government, uh, the major software are still, you know, was SARS. But uh, starting from uh, two years ago, the, I mean, the patent totally changed. Uh, you know, right now, uh, most of the U.S. government, you know, they move their database into a new computational uh, system. They call it a data grid. You know, some, some, some parallel computation platform developed by some guy from, uh, from Berkeley. And then nowadays, it's like everyone, if we work with the government, with the central Medicare, Medicare, we need to use the new platform. That means we cannot use SARS anymore. Even R and the Python are not good enough anymore. We need to new, learn a new language. It's called Spark. The underlying software called Scalar or something like that, designed for kind of communication. You know, it's, it's developed by people from computer science. They are very powerful for data, manipul data manipulation and kind of communication. But the opportunity for us is that those software are developed by experts from computer science, even though they are good at the parallel limitation. The you know the modeling part is still quite limited. That's the our opportunity. For example, we can develop our own code. Then our code, you know, uh, I mean in the past, because the majority of the researchers we will use SAS. SAS, you know, it's software developed by some professional company. Even though we have better modeling, we have better code. But maybe not too many people will use our code, they will still use SAS. But now totally different. If we really develop something really good, you know, all the researchers across the country will use our software. You know, that's part of the you know, example. We need to learn new technology. And at the same time, we may you know, have better influence compared with people. Yeah, I, I definitely agree about the, the software aspect of it. Um, there are things that we do now that just wouldn't would not have been possible um, a while ago, um, especially with these large scale databases. Um, like I work with, you know, na national registries um, that are just huge millions or billions of records. So um, when we try and implement some of these methods, just having the, the this you know computational framework is really helpful. And then the other thing I would add is just with the um, you know, the new AI tools that are out there. That's really become a really big topic in a lot of statistical conferences within the statistical community, people are talking about how to use this as an actual tool um, and really trying to be on top of it um, and, and make sure that the statisticians are aware of these uh, uh, new technologies and like really leveraging the, their abilities and their, their own work. Yes. So um, you guys kind of spoke about like um, the clinical applications and the collaborative collaborative nature of Michigan Math Statistics. I was just kind of wondering if you guys can go more into maybe some of the other collaborations you do with maybe Michigan Medicine or just other departments around the school. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, for myself, I'll speak um, to that, that um, I work a lot with uh, kidney transplant surgeons um, and nephrologists and then also some um, uh, policymakers who are involved in that. Um, 
So the surgeons are mostly interested in, in the quality of their care to make sure that the um, kidney patients are, you know, are, are having good outcomes after surgery. And then another really important question is whether they're getting access to transplants because there's so few resources, we need to make sure that um, the system is equitable and, and that patients you know, are, are, are participating in a fair system and getting those transplants. Um, so I work with them to look at population level data and, and some um, uh, clinical data as well. I also work with some epidemiologists who are studying strokes um, around the country. Um, so that's another direction where they have a full cohort study and we're looking at patients in that way. Um, but yeah, I would say most of the faculty here, faculty here have some sort of connection outside the department with either Michigan Medicine, Cancer Center, um, uh, other centers throughout the, the school, uh, university. So it's just a wide range of collaboration. Right. For example, uh, we work at the CAG. CAG, you know, it's a combination of you know, faculty and staff from different departments, like internal medicine, department transplantation, department surgery, and epidemiology, health policy, and then biotification. You can see, you know, teamwork is very important. Especially, you know, if we want to do, really want to do good research, then the teamwork is quite important. To my knowledge, my colleagues, like from cancer center, they work from expert in the cancer, you know, collaboration is quite important for us. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, one and a half of my collaboration are, you know, with, uh, with cancer oncologists, but uh, the other half I work with a variety of uh, uh, collaborators. We've got a lot of wind project with uh, people in internal medicine. They study uh, uh, the effect of uh, androgen, you know, on, uh, on cardiovascular disease in uh, postmenopause women. And then there's a project with people in uh, school pharmacy. There are projects with people in kinesiology, you know, on exercise, on reducing fat. So, and I also have projects, you know, with people in chemical engineering, developing new imaging technology to, you know, measure different kinds of samples. So essentially, like I said, one of the reasons that attract me into this job is um, the flexibility. That, you know, the, the flexibility you have about choice of your research, right? You can just it's a huge canvas. You go to any event, you run into different people, you talk to them what they're working on. Sometimes that just can come out with a new idea and a new project. Anything is possible, anything. So that's what really made it very exciting. As you mentor your um, students, grad students, whether a PhD or a master, what are some skills or values that you found uh, makes them successful? Yeah, I, I, I think many, and depending on individuals, uh, some will come with very strong background in certain, in others, right? So you have to develop sort of, we want our skills to be uh, well on it. So the course first give you all the theoretical applied foundation and skills. But then the students need to pick up things like you know programming on the side, and then communication, including both like presentation, also writing skills are very very important. We have a course emphasize on that, and the capstone course is really emphasize on that. And you know uh, besides that, you know there are also a lot of uh, like uh, professional development, like the course I'm teaching. How do you really blend in the teamwork? How do you manage your time? How do you meet deadlines? All of those. In the end, you know, like both sides are very very collaborative, which means. You pretty much in the end always work with the team, right? So how to communicate with people, how to you know make sure the project move on. There, there, you know, a lot of times the, the, the what stops you from moving forward is not technical issues, also you know, waiting for some other people to do something else. How do you really you know time that make sure you know things are moving forward? There's a lot of soft skills as well got involved as say. Uh, we a lot of them we do not only like teach those courses, but they learn those from like practical experience like doing research, doing collaborative research. Yeah, from the research point of view, you know, we have different pros and cons. You know, I guess again, people are planning to do uh, what they are good at. You know, some people may be good at computational, some people may be good at uh, the collaboration, some uh, students may be good at the theoretical part. You know, for the, for the research part, the good thing for me is we are a very big department. No matter you know which field you would like to work with, you can always find an expert. You know, in that field, you can work with them together. And as a student from the uh, cost preparation point of view, uh, I think to me, you know, is that you, you may look, have a look at our syllabus, like the core courses you will take, depending on whether you are master or whether you are PDD, then you can look at, you know, what textbook we are using, and you can have a look, then you will have a sense what you need to prepare. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think the really nice thing about Michigan Biostat is that 
uh, students get this really rigorous training in the statistical concepts, but then we also really emphasize being able to communicate that, as we mentioned. Um, like in the capstone course, we work a lot on writing and presenting. And also, if you have a research assistant position, that's also um, a really great opportunity to get some hands-on experience doing that. Like if you have to interact with a medical collaborator one-on-one, -on -one, those are some really important skills that you develop here. Um, learning how to figure out what you even need to do, and then at the end, making sure you write it up in a way that could be understood to a medical audience, I think is a really valuable skill that we work, that we teach here. Yes. I'm a little familiar with what uh, I guess like the second year capstone project that looks like for master students, but is it possible you guys could go into a little more depth about I guess what that looks like in the curriculum for that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so the the structure of the course um, it's it's called six ninety nine. They have basically what they'll have is some sort of collaborator come in and present their problem, pr present their data set, and you essentially need to figure out how to do the analysis. So um, you decide on your own the best way to approach it, um, and then you'll end up writing a report. Um, so writing up the results, writing it sort of as a paper. Um, so you get the skills in figuring out the correct statistical approach, but then also um, the best way to present it, and then you will give an oral presentation usually to the class um, talking about what your approach was and sort of justifying the methods you used. Yeah, right. In fact, that's one of our best courses. As Nico mentioned, you can learn a lot of experience from that. You will benefit for your future research. Not just about the mathematical concept you learn from the class. You will know in practice there's no golden answer. There's no solution manual for real data research. Even our faculties, by the way, usually three faculties, you know, will co-teach that course simultaneously. You will see, even our faculty members have different options, we have different choice, we have different opinion, which measure is more suitable for that particular application project. It's very good experience. Yeah, I don't have much to add, but the capstone course is the very last semester, so the hope is that you use all your learning in the previous three semester into that course, but what's still an often found is that they still have to learn something new to do the project there. So it's always a constant learning process which mimics what's happening in reality. And also in, part, uh, in that course, you have an individual project, you have a group project, you know, basically a combination of different things. One thing I will add is that 699 was for the BioStat Master Program, but now for the new Health Data Science Master Program, we have a parallel course for the 629, which basically is still same same format, project driven, just a project of sort of a more like modern day data type of a uh, What's the like PhD dissertation format? Is it like a big dissertation like tome or is it like several smaller papers? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? So um, it's case by case. Um, you know, it could be historically, it could be like you just write one monologue on a problem, you know, you go inside out and everything. But I think nowadays more common happening is that it's a combination of three main chapters. Each one focus on one problem, like it develops some novel methods, you know, trying to out there. The three problems usually are connected, but not always. Like, you know, maybe the second problem or the second problem is an extension of the first method, things like those. But often, you know, they could be like less or like connected. So it's all always case by case, depending on because things moving fast, right? If the PhD span like three or four or five years. Things change. What you have, have thought about three years ago might be different now, right? So you have to adapt to that, you know, uh, alongside the people. So essentially, um, it's what you and your advisor figure out that's the best for you. Yeah, right. Usually, you know, if you include three chapters, you can consider like three, you know, papers, three manuscripts, but the, we have a different field, we have a different group. Maybe the criteria and, and the topic can be quite different. Again, uh, same to me, the, the big advantage. For example, you can see I uh, I was a student at the care. Uh, when I did my job interview, I was asked by this kind of question, why I chose to stay in you know Michigan, stay in the same department. Uh, same to me, the, the major region is very big department. No matter which field I would like to work with, I can always find an expert I can work with together. Yes. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than just um, I think a lot of times once you finish a project, it opens up a lot more questions. So 
I, I find that happens a lot with the dissertation where you finish chapter one and you're like, well, there's all these other things now I want to explore and that can lead to the next chapters. And it doesn't always, but um, yeah, that could be one way it develops. Thank you all. Yep. Um, I, I'm not sure about, I'll be joining the lunch. I'm not sure you guys, but you know, feel free to have more questions and you know, talk to us later. Yep. Uh, and welcome and uh, enjoy the rest of your day here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.